Hey guys, Dr. Mike Ezratel here for RPU and RP Plus. Going to be talking or introducing one of our first courses after you have gotten through the introduction to sport and exercise science. And this is one of our most foundational courses, introduction or to another course is called Theory of Science. And today it's the lecture one foundations for the theory of science. So what the heck is a theory of science? What's on the agenda? Well, let's see. We're basically introducing you guys into the world of, first of all, understanding what science is, and second of all, learning to think more like a scientist. That doesn't mean you have to become a scientist at the end of this course or at the end of all the courses you're going to uh, sort of take on RPU, but if you learn to think like a scientist does in a measured, logical, systematic way, then you can start to figure out a whole lot more stuff and be much more certain of your conclusions, fall for less hype and BS, and just be very much better off and make better decisions, which is what education is really all about. So I'm going to talk about the nature of reality a little bit because science has a whole lot to do with figuring that out. We're going to talk about how to best perceive reality and figure out what reality is because some stuff is pretty mysterious and we have some things to get over. We're going to talk about exactly what science is and then a future or, or, or directions into where to take our new understanding of what science is and how best to apply it. So Starting out with some really, really, really philosophical stuff. The first question, well, the claim is that science, I think, or something like, tends to observe the real world. But before we get to that, we have to ask if there is a real world. If you've seen the movie The Matrix, then uh, I guess there's still a real world in The Matrix, but people uh, just didn't think it was uh, the world they were looking at. So is there a real world? Or is it potentially an illusion? Right? Uh, maybe. Is the real world uh, simply a matter of perception? That's another interesting idea. You'll hear people saying things like that. Well, you know, the truth isn't objective. It's a matter of where you're looking from. And if you perceive it, you can, if you believe it, you can achieve it, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, people will say, you know, well, your world that you're coming from is different than my world. And do people really live in different worlds? Do we create our own realities to some extent? And really, the question we're asking is, does reality differ based on who's observing the reality? Or is there an actual world external to our perceptions that is, in fact, real? And we'll talk about how we got to this idea in just a bit. But a little bit of soft philosophy for you. This is kind of like really, uh, you know, high level stuff. It's not into the depths. Is that nearly all of the evidence that we're able to collect through a variety of um, examination mechanisms points to there being an actual real world. So, uh, and it's very likely that humans are just some of the machines uh, living in the real world. And uh, that our observation probably doesn't create the world, but rather perceives it. So reality is almost certainly not like a dream where you create what you see, but much more like a computer program in which you are just one of the characters. The program exists very much outside of just you as a character, and if you're a character in a computer program, that computer program has created you. So the world created you and you live in it versus you create the world and are able to change it at will or something like that. Just as a sort of cursory examination of why and how that's true, we can do some thought experiments. Philosophers do a whole lot more of these very intricate thought experiments uh, more often, and by doing these, they've come to a variety of more uh, kind of dependable conclusions than we can come to here. But we'll do two quick thought experiments uh, to kind of uh, assuage our skepticism that the world is real. So let's say you're a, what's called in philosophy a pure subjectivist, and you believe that subjective experience, that everything that you experience is something that's created by your mind, and that there is no actual objective reality. Well, if you really do believe that, there are two thought experiments. These are not real experiments. So at least one of them would be a really bad idea in real life. That you can go through 
to begin to shed some doubt on the fact that the world is entirely a projection, and to probably shift the balance of the scales into the idea that the world is probably real. The first one is uh, something, uh, a thought experiment that I've named the semi-truck thought experiment. So if an individual, and this is kind of like par for the course for philosophy undergrads uh, or, or high school students, really convinced of pure subjectivism that we do in fact create our perception and create the world that we perceive every time like a dream, uh, if one of those individuals is very serious, I would encourage them to think about what it would be like to step in front of a semi-truck going down a road at 90 miles an hour. Now, if the world really is all about perception, maybe you could perceive that the truck isn't there. Maybe you could perceive that you're infinitely infallible and super strong and this truck would hit you and nothing would happen. Uh, maybe you could perceive that the whole thing was an illusion and you would simply wake up or restructure reality to be on a sunny beach sipping a pina colada and no more truck because it was all in your mind. A lot of people, I, I say probably a minority of actual philosophers, um, a huge minority of philosophers, a minority of people in general, actually hold these views, but to pretty much every single one of them that's not mentally unwell, a pure subjectivist simply will not stand in front of a semi-truck for some strange reason. And that strange reason is that no matter what they say or articulate or uh, conjecture upon in very esoteric, fancy, logical terms, they don't actually believe in pure subjectivism, because if they did, they would at least be amenable under some conditions to standing in front of a frighteningly fast semi-truck approaching. The fact that almost it all by almost, I mean, 99.99999% of anyone who, in, uh, who takes subjectivist views very seriously will not stand in front of a semi-truck uh, kind of uh, be betrays a bit of their actual philosophy, is that whatever they use uh, to sort of mental, uh, I don't want to say mental masturbation, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but whatever they use to mentally entertain themselves about what the structure of the world is or whatever they like to believe, they don't actually believe that well in subjectivism because they seemingly don't believe uh, that they can do anything about the oncoming truck, and they pretty well believe that if that truck hits them, then that is simply a very high momentum containing, high kinetic energy containing object that hits them, and they are also an object. They are a system of physical machines, the sum total and operation of which keeps them alive, including allowing their brain to operate. And the brain is the seat of who you are and who they are. So they're under the supposition that once that kinetic energy via truck arrives to brain, it will destroy the brain and, well, the whole body with it. And death, at, at very least serious injury, will result with no real ability to alter that outcome. Right? We could have used a worse thought experiment for subjectivism Maybe someone could say, you know, if you're uh, flipping coins or something like that, and, and maybe if you really believe they're going to more land on heads than tails, it will happen. Well, you know, if you, uh, a lot of people would take that bet uh, just because there's not much to lose. So if the, you know, coin lands on tails more often than heads, un unlike you predicted, or if it averages 50-50 like it usually does, Oh, well, you know, but I still think subjectivism has some merit. But the semi-truck thought experiment is very interesting because no one takes that challenge for a very good reason. Because deep down at the end of uh, a lot of uh, philosophizing, most people are actually what in philosophy is termed an objectivist. People who believe reality doesn't negotiate with us, but we negotiate with it. And there are objects outside of our reality that can damage our reality very much by damaging that which produces our own personal reality, the brain. And that brain is a machine, and there's no way to perceive around that. If that machine is hurt or destroyed, bad things happen, including death. So if you ever run into real, any real serious objectives and say, well, I don't really believe in science because how can you really measure reality when reality is a matter of perception? 
is reality really a matter of perception? And if they say, oh yeah, I really think so, you just explain the semi-truck thought experiment to them and watch them get probably at the very least uncomfortable. And uh, I haven't heard a very good refutation of the semi-truck thought experiment. I mean, I'm sure Magneto from the X-Men would have a pretty good response to that. Like, Shazam! But, but then again, he has uh, superpowers, so that doesn't count. The semi-truck thought experiment is pretty gnarly. It's kind of morbid. Uh, by kind of, I mean completely. And people can say, well, you know, that's really crazy. Not everyone's getting hit by trucks every day. Uh, maybe we could use an example that is more real world day to day. And we can. And that example is uh, what I term the alarm clock thought experiment. So people will say things like, well, you know, reality is not real and it's a matter of our perception. We construct reality. Okay. You got an important interview where you have to go to class. You wake up. Because your alarm clock rings at 6.30 a.m. You have to be at the interview by 8 a.m. It's going to take you 30 minutes to shower and 30 minutes to get there. And you want to get there a little early, grab a snack, whatever. So the alarm clock rings at 6.30 a.m. What percent of people with an important oncoming interview actually wake up then? Well, probably most, almost all. Why? What philosophical reason are they depending on? Well, they are depending on the fact that linear time, or whatever the shape of time is, exists outside of our perception. And no matter how we perceive time to be going, it's still going without our permission. There is a reality external to us that includes the passage of time. And we're also under the assumption that the alarm clock, it being a clock, is in touch with that distinct, objective, inalterable by anything other than quantum level or super high gravity forces or something like that, inalterable by us in day-to-day -day life, and that alarm clock is measuring that accurately. So when the alarm clock says it's 6.30 in the morning, depending on where you live and what time of the year it is, you can bet the sun is either still not up or the sun is up. You can bet that it's morning, that people are getting ready to go to work. You can bet that traffic is going to start to suck. And most importantly, you can bet that in about an hour and a half of linear passage of time, without any of your permission, you're going to have that interview. That interview is going to happen with you or without you. And there's not a damn thing you can do about changing it. So the very same people that will often argue well, you know, reality is subjective and, you know, there's differences based on observers. How many of those people, when they teach their philosophy lectures at universities, don't wake up with the alarm clock? Oh, very few. Almost all those same people still wake up at 6.30 when their alarm clock rings. And they might snooze it for a couple of minutes, but they know what snoozing means. They know it means that they're squishing the rest of their schedule, which is a fine trade-off to make, but they know it's a trade-off. They know that there's nothing they can do in their own personal reality to throw time back. How many of you guys have wished you could do that in the morning? Hell yeah, I have that dream like every day, right? I wish I could just not have time and sleep for another eight hours or something crazy like that, but that's not up to us. And that blaring sound of the alarm clock is a constant reminder of the fact that no matter what people say we are always running under the assumption of an objective reality external to us. Right? So taking those two things together, and of course philosophical writings of individuals much smarter and more well-educated in philosophy than me, we can start to get to the assumption that the world is real and has structure, and we can observe that structure and interact with it, is there a chance we have to leave out, just because we're not totally sure of anything, that that's not really the case? Is there a chance that we live in the Matrix? Yes, of course. But if that's your big bet, life's going to be really confusing, very difficult, and if you do anything really extreme about that, quite short. But if you run on that as a bet of, yeah, the world's probably real, and we're just machines living in it, you're going to make a whole lot of sense of a whole lot of stuff. So is there a chance that subjectivism is true? Yeah, of course. What is that chance based on all of the experiences that humanity has ever had in sum total? Based on the fact that subjectivism as a pure philosophy of an individual actually changing the world by simply thinking about it has never been recorded to exist once? Um, that's bad news for subjectivism and good news for a dependable reality that is most likely extant. It's most likely there.
So we can probably run with the assumption and be quite safe that the world is real. So we've gotten over that hurdle. But the world is really complicated in a couple of ways. First of all, sometimes the world can be too complex to make sense of right away. So for example, if you look at stock prices altering and fluctuating and up and down, why are they going up and why are they going down? Oh, oh my God, the complexity of stock prices is insane. As a matter of fact, very few to nobody can predict where stock prices are going to go. If you look at a field, just an open meadow by a forest, and you zoom in on anything, there are trillions of macromolecules interacting in organelles, interacting in cells, making tissues, making organs, making organ systems, making the billions of insects you see right in front of you, different species, all kinds of stuff. They're all moving in different directions. There's 50 different species of plants. All of them have their own molecular machinery, and all of that is interacting all the time. The real world is really complicated, super complicated. So figuring it out, yeah, sure, the world has structure, but that doesn't mean it looks like Tetris. It's much more complicated than that. So complicated, we can't ever really meaningfully perceive a whole bunch of it at the same time. That doesn't mean that we're totally lost, but we're going to need one hell of a powerful tool to figure some stuff out. In addition to that, the world isn't just super complex, but perceiving it is a little difficult at times because sometimes it can play tricks on us. Reality sometimes is what it seems, or very close, and sometimes it's not. For example, there are visual illusions, right? If you are unaccustomed to looking at skyscrapers or don't know what uh, city you're looking at, let's say you're visiting a city and you haven't been to it before, you can be at the airport and see the skyline from the actual uh, airplane window, right, as your plane parks at the gate, and go, oh my god, that one building looks really tall compared to the others. But it turns out that building's not that tall. It's very tall, but there's five other taller buildings. It just happens to be closer to the airport and the other one's further away. So if you were to look for that one building and be like, yeah, yeah, I want to visit the tallest building. It looks like this. It's a rectangle. People are like, yeah, there's little buildings that are the super tall that have rectangles. You're like, no, no, it's this one. They're like, oh, that one, that's not so super tall. And you're like, oh my God, I've misperceived reality, right? Uh, what about a mirage in a desert? You think it looks like water? Unfortunately, it's just more desert. So sometimes when we look out into this meadow of complexity, uh, we can't be so sure that we're not being fooled by our eyes and various other senses. Right? So it's not open and shut. We don't perceive the world directly. We have to interpret it. Sometimes our interpretations are wrong. Secondly, so there's a problem of interpretation on the input end. And there's another one on the processing end. Internal biases that we have can cloud our judgment because we want certain things to be more true than others. Right. So if you watch a mixed martial arts fight and you have a favorite opponent that's in the match, your favorite fighter, and he's fighting against somebody, it's very difficult to see the fight objectively. If you judge the fight, you'd probably judge it all wrong because when your fighter got hit, you'd probably be like, yeah, but those are kind of shitty hits. They look kind of unplanned. They didn't have a lot of power. They were like little taps. Eh, half a point here and there. But when your fighter did anything remotely athletic, you'd be like, wow, I mean, this guy's really dominating the fight. He's showing great octagon control. This is awesome. Just because you want some things to be true or some things to be the way they are can heavily cloud your judgment. And all of a sudden, the world you're seeing with your eyes, uh, the world you're perceiving rather, is a little bit different, meaningfully different than what's actually really happening. And that's unfortunate because you're not getting a clear picture of what's really going on. And going back to the existence of objective reality, because the world is a certain way, uh, you'd probably in your best interest to see it exactly how it is, because that stuff's going to affect you, right? If you really don't want the semi-truck to be there and you man managed to pull a real big one on yourself and convince yourself that the semi-truck's not really going to hit you, that maybe if you squint like this way, that way, it looks like it's going to pass you in the other lane. Maybe that's not a good idea. Maybe there's a semi-truck coming at you. It's in your best interest to find out no matter what you want. Of course, we don't want to get hit by the truck, but it's probably a good idea to really perceive its motion accurately to determine well, what is the probability that thing's going to hit me, right? And if that probability is anything other than very low, uh, it's probably a good idea to start to plan to get out of the way. Right? So it's important to perceive reality. So... 
The world is basically a huge sea of variables interacting with each other like zillions of times per second. And how do we see its clear logical structure? Because we've already assumed that it has one. And we've discovered much later that it does in fact have one. But how can we be more certain of reality than a mere guess? Because right? remember, reality is important. It comes back to bite you. And if you just merely guess, you're going to guess wrong sometimes. So we want clarity. If we want clarity, we're going to need two things. First, we're going to need to quiet our minds so that we can observe objectively. We basically want to eliminate or control for as much bias as possible. We're going to want to really work on that, and there are ways to do that, to make sure that the world we're perceiving is for sure at least closer to real than we would have been had we not accepted our bias. Just a really quick example of that from semi-truck experiment is you look at the truck and you're like, oh, it's probably not headed to me. And then you examine your feelings and you go, hmm, yeah, I don't think that because I don't want it to be heading over here. Uh, here's a much, much better example, right? Let's say you dragged all of your friends to the amusement park because you really wanted to go. And it's awesome. There's roller coasters. People are having fun. Some of your friends kind of wanted to go to the lake instead, and they got dragged along, and they're cool. They're having fun, right? But they're like, yeah, you know, if this doesn't work out, we can just go to the lake. But there's you really want to be there, and there's like five more rides you want to ride, and you just, you, the lake is cool, but you really want to ride these five rides. You haven't yet. You got to wait in line. And all of a sudden, you see some thunderclouds on the horizon. Thunder clouds look like they may be headed towards the amusement park. Now, if you really want to quiet your mind, you got to admit something. Admit your bias that you don't want the clouds to be coming over this way. You really don't. You would rather have just them disappear, go back, or at the very least, you could say, yeah, mm, yeah, you know, it looks like they're coming this way, but maybe they, I think they're going to be off the little to the left. The reason you think that even in your sort of uh, lonely moments, admit that not even think that, but want to think that, is because you want the end result of that process to be we stay at the amusement park. You have a bias towards wanting to stay, and that's going to alter your perception of reality away from what reality actually is. Now, your friends might have a bias in the opposite direction. So the ones that really kind of want to be at the lake instead go, ooh, 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 yeah, look, look at those thunder clouds. Look at that. Uh, lightning's going to kill you on that roller coaster. It's going to be terrible. Zeus, his revenge is swift. You, we should leave now because look at those clouds, man. That's, that's crazy. They're sh for sure coming here. Look at them. They're getting bigger all the time. They might not actually believe that deep down, but their biases lead them to wanting to believe that much more than reality. So a big part about quieting our minds, and there are other ways to do to, to remove bias, but one of the biggest ones is simply admitting what do I want to happen and how is that altering my thinking? It's a really powerful weapon. And then if you actually succeed in altering or, or sort of countering for that, you go, okay, I definitely want to stay here. But really, what do those storm clouds look like they're doing? Well, it looks like they're not moving yet. So let's, I'm going to tell my friends, hey, listen, if those clouds start coming over here, you guys are right. We should just head off the other direction to go to the lake. Totally. But if they're not heading over here, let's stay. Let's give it an hour, see what happens. That's an objective response based on reality. And then as reality updates and the clouds are looming and coming closer and you can see the rain coming down a couple miles away over, you know, the horizon, you go, ah, I, 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 it's time to go. Right? Or if the clouds just kind of wither away or go off on their own and there's more sunshine, you're good to go and keep, you know, riding your favorite roller coaster. So that's how we're, you know, going to start with just the idea of quieting our minds so we don't have to be as biased, but we also want to quiet the noise, the complexity so that we can see the only the variables that we want to know about, right? Because very complex situations with variables going each and every way, it's really difficult to assess what's actually going on, right? So we want to make sure that we have tools to quiet our minds so we can perceive more accurately and quiet the surroundings and quiet the area to make sure that we can perceive in a way that is one effect at a time. For example, if someone brings their dog to the park and claims that it can do really cool tricks, and he's giving the dog food and telling it to do tricks, and it's kind of not, are you going to believe that the dog actually can't do tricks? Well, maybe, 
But there's like 50 other dogs around and everyone's grilling hot dogs and stuff like that. So the dog's only goes, <laughs> and you can tell when it's looking at the owner, right? Uh, the owner's like, come on, do your trick, Fido. And Fido's like, oh my God, okay, the owner trick, uh, but hot dogs, other dogs, smells, craziness outside, right? It's super complicated environment. It might not be the best environment for us to perceive the exact effect we're looking for. So maybe it's a good idea after the park for you to come back to that uh, friend's house with the dog, Everything's quiet. It's the same house, all the same smells. Dog calms down. He's like, okay, watch this. Do it, Fido. If Fido doesn't do anything, you should be like, okay, bro, we've isolated a lot of other variables. It's his house, the usual environment, not a lot of complexity. He's still not doing anything. You know what? You're right. I, I just don't think he learned it. Yesterday he was doing it, but it just didn't hang in there. So there's a lot more to say on how we're going to do that scientifically, but those are the basic ideas. A quick example uh, or, or further examples of how we could do that. So... We could ask the question in sport and exercise science, does squatting lead to bigger legs than leg pressing? First of all, we have biases to squash before we can even begin to design uh, some way of ascertaining that information. A bias I have is I like squatting better. Leg presses are cool, but squats are hardcore. Most of you guys probably think that. So a lot of you would say, oh, of course squats. But if you really had to design a study that was objective, you got to quiet those biases so you don't accidentally favor the squat group versus the leg press group or something to that effect. Right? And you have to quiet complexity. You can say, okay, well, so like all the guys that squat, you know, they have bigger legs than the people that leg press. Yeah, but the people that squat also tend to be more serious about lifting, so they're more consistent. The people that tend to leg press on average tend to be people that just don't want to train very hard, so they use a machine instead of free weights. People squat also have good technique, which means they're more invested in the process. Those kinds of people tend to grow more. They probably eat better too. They probably sleep better. So if you have a bunch of really big squatters with big legs, but a bunch of people who leg press with not so big legs, it's not quite certain what would happen if those big squatters brought that same tenacity and objectivity and desire and really good nutrition, etc., to a, a program designed primarily around leg presses. So it's very difficult just from observation to be able to be like, okay, so clearly we just have people who leg press, people that squat, and the leg press, people aren't as big, so squats lead to bigger legs. Not so fast, because we haven't isolated all the variables. There could be too much complexity for us to see the real truth. How are we going to quiet to the truth? Well, this is starting to sound a whole lot like science now. So what is science? It's a systematic method of observation that does two things. It quiets our biases and it quiets the complex external world to reveal the relationships between only our variables of interest. It allows us to see patterns, to see relationships of the things we want to see in a clear environment that is unbiased both by external factors and by our own mind. Thus, science is a path towards the proper observation of reality. That's really what science is all about. How do we quiet our biases? Well, usually we do it by rigid and formal study design that doesn't give advantage to any outcome, right? It's no longer a matter of perception, but the study is set up to collect certain data. And if you design the study right, it really doesn't matter what you want to happen, the methods are gonna speak for themselves. And how do we quiet the surroundings? Well, a lot of times there's no way to make things super quiet. But we know that most things, we have the variables that we want to measure, and everything else is just noise. But we can kind of assume that the noise is very similar all around. So what we do is we basically let the random noise cancel itself out, and the only things we're changing or the only things different between our comparison is the presence of the actual variables or the absence of their actual variables, or the variables are pointing up or they're pointing down. Everything else is still super complicated, but the only difference we have is between what we're looking at. Thus, if there is a difference in those two systems after that, if what we're observing is different, we can start to become fairly sure that because those variables we changed were the only thing different, there might be a cause and effect there, or at least something to look into. So if we do that, fundamentally we're being scientific. And the scientific method is defined very technically, dictionary definition as the procedure that consists in systematic observation, measurement, and experimentation, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. And the huge take-home message from that is that it is systematic, right? In the next lecture, we'll talk about hypotheses and theories and all this stuff, 
But systematic is what science is all about. Science is not a random guess. Science is not, oh, well, let's take a look here and see how we feel about things. It is systematic for two reasons. One, it's systematic to quiet our biases. Two, it is systematic to quiet all of the fluctuation of the external world. It's not systematic for no good reason. It's not like that uptight teacher who's uptight for no reason, right? Science is uptight, it's systematic, so that all of the other effects, all of the illusions can wash away and only reality remains. There are two ways in which science is done that reflect its structure. Two kinds of studies, observational studies and experimental studies. In observational studies, we kind of compare situations that are already ongoing, let the noise cancel out, and we can get a really good idea of what correlates with other things. So for example, if we look at sunburn, we try to see what correlates with sunburn, we can see that, well, you know, sunburn seems to go up a whole lot during summer. Is there something about summer that causes more sunburn? Maybe, right? Is there a cause and effect? Is there something about summer that causes sunburn? Uh, maybe. Also maybe, right? So great for generating hypotheses, but then we actually have to test those hypotheses. Great for generating ideas about how the world works, but then we have to test them. So how do we test them? Well, then we manipulate the actual variables ourselves. And then we measure the results. So the noise cancel out and we can measure cause and effect and no longer just correlation. Experimental studies are the golden fleece of science. They really tell us what's going on because now we're the ones changing stuff. So if you think that it's the radiation from the sun that is more pronounced in the summer that causes sunburn, then what you can do is get uh, some kind of tissue sample and then you can subject it to radiation. You're the person that you've got two tissue samples. One is getting subjected to radiation. One is in an identical environment and not getting subjected to radiation. And then 15 minutes later, you can examine them and see if that skin sample gets burnt or not. And if it does, well, gee, you looks like you found out what's going on in very basic terms. There are better ways to control that study. But fundamentally, if we are altering the system and we know what alterations we made and what we didn't, we can start to conclude with pretty high degree of certainty that the alterations we made are because, or, or the differences that emerge in the systems are because of the alterations we made. So now what is the relationship of science to the truth? The thing is, is that in all of those examples I described and all the studies ever done, no study is perfect because it has an error probability. There is a chance that the skin samples we got, one of the skin samples, something happened to it earlier. We don't know what it is, but that's what really causes burns. And it was simply accumulating all of that damage and transforming it into something we could see, an actual burn. And then when we shot it with ultraviolet radiation, uh, that was just superfluous, had nothing to do with what's going on. And it turned out that the sun has no effect on sunburns at all, that our study was flawed. We could have a chance event occur. So for example, the knob that turns on the radiation source could be broken and we didn't know about it. So we said we're exposing it to radiation and in fact the light turned on, but the light turned on and it's like a light bulb's worth of power because the knob, we were supposed to turn it all the way to high, but everything past low just doesn't work. We assumed it did, but it didn't, right? That's where error comes from a lot of the times is just the study screwed up and you don't know it did. So now all of a sudden we got a light bulb here and we got you know, plenty of light in the room. On the other sample, we notice that there is no effect and we say, gee, oh man, I, I, I guess the radiation from the sun doesn't actually burn anything because there is some, you know, the skin wasn't really burned and we, we subjected it to radiation. Studies make mistakes all the time. They usually don't, but there's a small percentage of chance that every study makes a mistake. So knowledge is never perfect. But science is really cool because we do study after study after study. And the more studies we do, if they continue to point in the same direction, science gets us closer and closer to the truth. Right? As the variables we're examining get more examined and we find out more about their details, we get more precise with what we're looking at, we can be more and more sure what we're looking at is the actual logical structure of the universe 
Put another way, we can be closer to the truth. One study is okay, not a whole lot to learn there, but if we do multiple studies in every conceivable angle and direction, testing the hypothesis from various points, and it all shows that, look, you blast radiation at something, it starts to degrade, and if that's human skin, it starts to burn. Yeah, we're probably onto the right thing. Now, one of the coolest ways to know that science is, is one of the coolest intuitive ways or very obvious ways to know that science must be onto the right thing isn't it some kind of weird experiment? I'm sure philosophers could figure out 50 ways in which we could be deluding ourselves. But where are we not deluding ourselves? What has science created for us? We said that science gets us closer and closer to the truth. And if science has been working for a really long time, it's going to get us damn near to the truth. It's going to allow us to see logical structures. Potentially, we can even manipulate those logical structures to get what we want. So what has science given us of what we want? Modern medicine. How's that first start? All right. So if you really don't think science is a good way of perceiving the truth, how come when you break your leg, you go to the hospital and not like a faith healer or something? You got bones sticking out of your leg. What are you assuming that the, surgeon, the surgeons at the hospital know? You're assuming they know the structure of legs. You're assuming they know the bones of the body. You're assuming they know the procedures scientifically derived, of course, as to how to take your bone, put it back into your leg, and sew you up. You're assuming that science is one hell of a path to the truth because your leg is broken and you're done playing around philosophy games. Absolutely. Sounds like the semi-truck experiment again. Maybe you broke your leg getting hit by the truck. That would be a small price to pay at 90 miles an hour. So... And it doesn't have to be that morbid, right? Antibiotics, cure diseases. How the hell did they do that? They weren't made by a random guess. Almost all modern antibiotics are engineered. They knew exactly what the bacteria looked like. They know exactly the shape of the molecule. They designed it to hurt that bacteria. That's what they designed it to do. What about astronomy? Scientists have cataloged and figured out a whole lot about planets and galaxies and everything else that we see in our universe. Predictably, they figure the stuff out. And they can tell you, hey, so in the night sky in three days, there's going to be a comet right over there. And it's going to swing by and it's going to swing away. And you're barely going to see it, but there it is. And you get your telescope out and sure enough, you're like, ah, they're bullshitting me. There's nothing there. Oh my God, there it is. They can predict celestial objects to within seconds of their arrival and departure. That's pretty sweet. Obviously, they got something right. They're very close to the truth on that. What about evolution, right? Evolution, very well studied, explains almost everything about the natural world. That's one hell of an achievement, right? And just think just about 130 years ago, evolution wasn't even a thing. That, that, not, most people didn't think that's how the world came to be, right? Most people didn't think that's how animals were designed is by evolution. What about psychology, right? If you show up to a psychotherapist who's good at his job and practices scientific th psychotherapy, that person is going to be able to talk to you in such a way that is going to be able to help you. It's going to be able to give you actual strategies to live your life more effectively and happier. Now, how the hell did he know that? He's not just making a random guess because science showed the path to how the mind actually works. And we're learning more every day about that. It happens. And now that we know a lot about how the mind works, we can alter our behavior or alter the mind to make it work better. Right? What about engineering and technology? If science really couldn't perceive how the world worked, how the hell are skyscrapers standing up? How do we have Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi wasn't around. It's not just something. It's engineered. How well do scientists know about electromagnetic signals and their manipulation? Well, enough to put information into digital form and transmit it anywhere in the world. Holy shit, that is a high level of super precise knowledge, right? Money and trading, food production. How much has science discovered about how to make more food, make it cheaper, and make it tastier? Well, we're supporting a global population of pushing 7 billion people now, and... We come from an evolutionary environment where hundreds of millions or tens of millions of us spread around the world were starving damn near half the time. Science has come a long way. There is no reason to doubt science as the best estimator of the truth, but there is every reason to try to learn how it works well so we can do it better, consume it better to make fewer mistakes. It's there for the taking when we need it. Right? So if we really want to know about something, what do we do? Well, we apply all the super powerful tools of science and we begin to get answers. They are small answers at first, 
very measured answers. Well, we think that, maybe that, and eventually as more studies come out, as more is learned, as more is confirmed, we start to get very, very, very confident, and eventually our knowledge becomes comprehensive and amazing. So that if you, God forbid, are sick and you go to the hospital, there are worlds, worlds of logical structures of information ready to help you. And that if you're sick with anything but some really exotic thing that no one's ever heard of before, you're gonna get the help you need because people have figured out a whole lot with modern science. So the next question is, how do we do science correctly? And that's in the next lecture. So I'll see you guys then for lecture two.